Thank you everybody for being here in person and on Zoom for the people that are on Zoom. Today we have our first formal speaker, Professor Lakadi surprised us with a lecture last time, which was great and we appreciate it. And today we have our first formal speaker, which is Professor Bill Spencer. Professor Spencer holds a doctoral degree in theoretical and applied mechanics from here from UIUC. He's an alumni. And after he was here, he was he served the University of Notre Dame for Notre Dame for 17 years. After that, he came here as a Nathan M. 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 Newmark, and now chair. And he's been a professor here, and his research has been primarily in the areas of structural health monitoring, structural control, cyber infrastructure applications, stochastic fatigue, and stochastic computational mechanics and natural hazards. Today he's going to teach us or give us a lecture about how computer vision can be applied or used in his field of infrastructure inspection and monitoring. So Professor Spencer, the floor is yours. We can see your screen. We can hear you clearly. So I'm going to mute and I'm going to turn the camera so you can see the classroom and then you can begin. Okay, thank you, Javier. I first want to apologize for not being there with you today. I know that uh, that's the normal mode, but if uh, many of you may have had my course in structural dynamics, and so you know that's a standard on Tuesdays and Thursday afternoons at 3.30 p.m. Uh, I don't think I would have been able to make it back uh, from Rantoul had I come up there and joined you personally. I hope I have the chance to do this again in the future. So today, I want to tell you a little bit about some of our work in uh, advances in computer vision-based civil infrastructure inspection and monitoring. This is some work that we have um, a wide variety of students uh, participating in, and I'll tell you a little bit about some of that work today. There we go. So first of all, I just want to point this out that uh, structural health monitoring it, in this ASCE Vision 2025 statement, they talk about relying on and leveraging real-time access to living databases, sensors, diagnostic tools, and other advanced technologies to ensure that informed decisions are made. And that's what really structural health monitoring is about. And so today in this talk, we're going to uh, consider some background and motivation. And then I'm gonna look at static monitoring using computer vision, dynamic monitoring, and then several applications and ongoing research. So background and motivation. First of all, what is vision? Vision is really an incredible feat of human intelligence. Uh, if you look at the macabre brain, virtually 50% is devoted to the task of vision. And more than any other task in the human brain is taken up by vision. So uh, just imagine that you're this individual and you look at this scene and you ask, is that a queen or a bishop? And you may not really realize how you make that assessment, uh, but let me tell you what the challenge is for the computer. What do you see here? If you look at that carefully, this is actually a, a double deck bridge. The top is for railroads, the bottom is for automobile traffic. And I made it deliberately vague. Uh, it's it's a, a bridge that's in Northern Illinois. And I, you, can, you can still figure out what it is. You see the truss, you see there's some power wires over top. But what does the computer see? The computer sees an array of numbers. Now I would challenge any of you if I gave you that array of numbers, could you tell me that that's a bridge? More or less anything about the shape or the members or the type of bridge. And so that's really what computer vision has to deal with. The goal is to extract useful information from this array of numbers, a very, very challenging task. So there's other things involved, like the number of pixels in that image that I showed you previously, it was rather coarse. And so uh, we, can re uh, we can realize or render a particular image with various levels of resolution as shown here, all the way from 
uh, four by six pixels on the lower left-hand side up to the top left-hand side where we have 1200 by 800. But then each of those pixel points has 24 bits of information, 24 zeros and ones. There's eight bits of red, eight of green, and eight of blue. And so this means that there's millions of bits of information in just a single, uh, single image. In the case of this um, rendering of the Army Corps of Engineers symbol in the top left, there's 23 million bits of information uncompressed. And when it gets into video, it's even more complicated because each of those pixels has a time variable associated with it. And so you have those 23 million bits of information times the number of samples that you're taking in time, the number of frames in time, which oftentimes is 30 or 60 frames per second. So a tremendous amount of information is generated from video. So let's look at where we uh, came from to the point today. Uh, the, the first issues or, or, or efforts in computer vision appear to have been in 1966 when Professor Minsky at MIT assigned a summer project to an undergraduate. And at that time, they were trying to interpret the synthetic world. So they would try to draw lines. We have a, a line here, maybe this could, number 37, 39, 38 could have formed a building where you had the vertical uh, edges of the building and you identified those. And then with that shape, you could say, oh, maybe this is a building. Uh, then it got to, um, there, there was more progress made on interpreting these images. As you can see here, this uh, image in the top left of this, uh, this four, the first thing to do is to identify the uh, separation lines between the components. And so this is the first effort and then that's refined a little bit. And then identifiers are put on these components. This is the sky, this is a tree, this is the building, more of the building, the road, the trees, underbrush. And, and so one can uh, make some identifications in this way. And then there was a shift towards more mathematical rigor rather than this ad hoc way of doing things. And artificial neural networks came on the scene in the 1980s, but they came and they went. And the reason being in 1985, I was a PhD student at the University of Illinois. And this IBM 4381 was the mainframe campus, our mainframe computer for the entire campus with a total of 24 megabytes of memory. And so this just wasn't enough to be able to, uh, to, to provide the computational power needed to use the neural networks. But then in the 90s, kind of one of the killer apps that came along was facial recognition and statistical analysis became in vogue. And then in the 2000s, broader recognitions, large annotated data sets became available and video processing started. And this was driven by huge advances in computer power. This is an Apple Watch 4, and it had, I believe, 16 gigabytes uh, of memory. We're currently on Apple's uh, sixth rendition of the uh, Apple Watch. And compare that to the 24 megabytes that this campus computer, mainframe computer had in 1985. And so then in 2000, uh, the, the 2010s in the last decade, GPUs and huge increases in computational power came about and we returned uh, to machine learning, artificial neural networks. And we'll see what the next decade holds with autonomous robot, uh, robots, self-driving cars, and maybe even the great robot rebellion. Now, this is all uh, driven also by digital camera resolution. If you note that the first digital cameras uh, in the mid 1970s, they had around a thousand pixels of resolution. That means that this is maybe 30 by 30 pixels. Compare that to what we have today with uh, megapixel resolution. This was the, the first really uh, portable camera. Uh, the, by Fuji, uh, commercially available, that had reasonable resolution. You had a uh, Logitech Photoman in about 2000 that was around $1,000, relatively cheap at the time. 
Uh, the Canon uh, EOS, one of the first digital single lens reflex cameras. And then, although it's disputed, it was in that same time period that uh, the 2000s that we finally had mobile phones with cameras on them. And then the iPhone X is up here. And finally, uh, this is uh, the Nikon D3500 where we had millions of pixels of resolution. And what happened with the commercialization of these uh, devices is that the cost per, pi uh, per pixel, this is uh, dollars per pixel, it reduced dramatically over the years to where we are at the point uh, today. And these technologies have been used for a wide variety of applications. If you go into the parking garage here just north uh, and a little bit east of Newmark Laboratory, you no longer have to have parking tags because it identifies the license plate on your car and then it checks it against its database to see is that car allowed to be in this garage. Uh, if not, then they'll send somebody over to give you a ticket uh, in case you didn't know. There's also um, facial recognition software. I like this Microsoft PIX software because it checks to see if your eyes are open and it doesn't take the picture. Uh, unless your eyes are open. That's uh, free software in case you've had problems with uh, getting your friends to keep their eyes open when you're taking pictures. Uh, there's fingerprint scanners. We've seen that. That's rather old technology these days, but this uh, vision-based biometrics, if, if you have seen this before, you know that this girl, uh, the young girl and this uh, uh, older woman are indeed the same person. And that was um, confirmed by biometric uh, analysis of the uh, iris patterns. But there's other types of things like uh, object detection and tracking. You can, uh, from a video feed, you can track pedestrians going down the road as shown here on the right. Um, so one question that was addressed in a few years ago was how long a BBC reporter could stay hidden from CCTV cameras in China. And so uh, currently at the time, this was a couple of years ago, there were 170 million surveillance, cam surveillance cameras, one camera for every eight people. With the projection of last year, there'd be 400 million. So about one camera for every three or four people. And so this fellow, you can look him up on YouTube, John Sudlow, BBC reporter on December 10th, he went to Guiyang and he wanted to see, this was with the cooperation of the Chinese government, how long it would take for him to uh, be found. And so if you guess one hour or two hours, you would be off by a lot because he was captured in just seven minutes. So very powerful technology. And we use that in the US maybe more commonly for object detection, like uh, in the football games, in soccer, in uh, hockey or in tennis. And more prevalently these days, there's the navigational robots that offer the potential for self-driving cars. There's the, if you've seen about the uh, computer vision on Mars with the, the rover, or as we mentioned, auto, autonomous robots to do assembly of all sorts of, of uh, um, manufacturing items. And then there's so much more from 3D imaging, MRI and, and CAT scans. There's image guided surgery. There's uh, point and find on uh, uh, Google goggles. One thing that I like is this star guide. It's an augmented reality. You point it towards the sky, the sky towards a star you have interest in. It shows you the constellation and tells you about that particular uh, image in the sky. And then there's, um, all sorts of animation coming out of Hollywood that is, uh, is, is enhanced with uh, computer vision. As you can see here, in the lower image, there's a man with some targets on his head. And then the top image is what we saw in the movies where this, um, uh, this ghoul was superimposed over the man using computer vision. So how does that re relate to civil engineering? Well, computer vision, and structural health monitoring seem like they're naturally go together. Currently, the man, uh, manual inspection is the main form of assessing the condition of civil infrastructure in the US. And so using computer vision 
for structural health monitoring, given what I've shown you, it seems like a natural step forward and could be readily adopted to aid and eventually replace manual inspection while offering new advantages and opportunities. So I wanna show you some of the things from a civil engineering perspective that can be done with computer vision. Here we have some work coming out of Germany. This is a retaining wall. Yeah, go ahead. Question? Uh, Question, folks? Okay. Um, so this is a retaining wall. And this uh, Professor uh, Hollerman, he flew a UAV survey taking a, a range of images. And then he went back and he replaced, artificially uh, replaced the blocks with some other images to simulate damage. And so he then flew another, um, uh, flew another survey. And then this was the change state image where they're in that red dot, you can see there's been some uh, markers put on there. And then finally, there was change detection done with the computer. Now that seems like a pretty straightforward uh, concept to be able to monitor that retaining wall. But I, I thought this was very clever. This is work of Kenichi Soga. And this was for monitoring the, um, the, the tubes for the subway in London, critical to their economy. And so the idea was that they would put an array of synchronized and overlapping cameras on a cart, uh, this flatbed trolley that you see here. Whoops. This flatbed trolley that you see here. And those cameras would then be moved through the tunnel on that cart and there would be a survey done as you can see here on the right to create a database of the tunnel lining and then later some inspector comes along and they says gee you, you know i'm looking up at that particular point on the tunnel i didn't remember that being uh that, that having that kind of feature is that damage was that like that before and so one can take an image, register it in the database, as shown here in the lower right, you've got a new query image, and then you can look at the binary change mask, which shows you, hey, in this case, that is different than what we saw during, when we did the initial survey. And so that um, allows one to do inspections in between these comprehensive surveys. Another possibility is for assessing cracks in, in structures, uh, Work has been done in concrete, in, uh, in steel structures. This is particular work that some of my students did on assessing the, uh, the, the size of concrete cracks automatically and then creating uh, 3D renderings of, of these images so that one can assess the uh, meaning of the crack and interpret the crack. And we've looked to extending that to crack assessment in our work with the, uh, the US Army Corps of Engineers. As you can see here on, uh, this is a, a lock gate on the Mississippi River, and you can see here things that look a little bit like cracks, but there's some things that look like cracks and some things that look like just uh, look simply like seams. And so using computer vision, we can identify those uh, cracks and then we can calculate the length and the width and use these images to continuously monitor uh, these, these cracks. This is some work from Professor Shirley Dyke at uh, Purdue University. She got her undergraduate degree at Illinois uh, and then did her PhD at uh, Notre Dame. And this was a test structure in the Bowman Laboratory at, at Purdue where they wanted to do some automatic inspection of the joints on this truss. As you know, for a truss like this, it's the welded joints that are almost always going to see uh, damage. And so there were 118 welded connections and they used computer vision to uh, survey those, uh, those joints and then to move through and one could do an assessment uh, looking at point A, point B, point C and understand whether there might be damage or to do change detection as we talked before. This is some work of uh, Veda Saskari, one of my former PhD students, where the idea is that rather than just taking an image and asking where are the cracks, where are 
um, where is the damage, where is the spalling exposed rebar, is that first one looks at the scene of the building. So for example, we know there's no damage in the windows. And so one excludes the damage or the region in the windows to look for damage, finds the region of interest, and then predicts what kind of uh, features are being seen. So here's an example where the, uh, we have four images here. These are the original images. This is the scene of the building where the yellow indicates the region that we're interested in. Uh, in the third column, this is the damage that's been identified, whether it's exposed rebar, cracking, spalling, greenery, sky, debris, uh, et cetera. And then that's superimposed on the building so that there's uh, a better chance of correctly identifying what's going on in this, um, in this structure. So just as an, an example, you can see right here from my cursor that there is damage in the window. And clearly that's not uh, real. And that's taken out when you go to the superimposed final output. So let me talk a little bit about dynamic monitoring rather than the static monitoring using computer vision. So this is a structure in our laboratory and we wanted to show that you could extract displacements directly from the video. So even though this is a single video, we're able to get seven uh, displacements, the big displacement of the ground and the displacements of each of the floors. And then that can be used to do modal analysis. And what you see here is a comparison of the still camera uh, that we were using versus the uh, high quality accelerometers. And both the mode shapes and the frequencies were correctly identified. Now, this is a bit of research that was out of MIT. It's called motion magnification, and it's really uh, pretty cool. If you look at this picture here, if you, I've put my cursor over it so you can see that's a video, but if I didn't do that, I think you would have imagined that this was a still image. The point is, is that you can't really see anything there. The motion is too small. Here I've zoomed in on it. This is still a video and you can kind of see the vibration of maybe this guitar string. I don't know how it's coming across over Zoom. But if we use this motion magnification, it's something like an oscilloscope zooming in. Now you can see on the right, you, there's still the original video on the left with virtually no motion. But on the right, this is processed so that we can see this motion. It's magnified to illustrate the vibration characteristics there. You can also see this, uh, second, this third string here. Now, I like this because I'm a structural dynamics guy. And if you've taken my course, you know about modal decomposition. What we tell you is that the motion of this structure on the left, and here it's zoomed in, that it is comprised of the motion in the first mode, the second mode, in the third mode, and the fourth mode, and the fifth mode, and the sixth mode. And you might imagine that here, most of the motion looks like it might be in the first mode. But if we use this motion magnification, you can see that there's motion in the first mode, but there's also substantial motion in the second and third modes, and, and even at times in the, uh, in the higher modes. But what we've done is taken this video that was on the left, uh, that's on the left, and then we've decomposed it into those motion, into those components, so that you can actually see that modal decomposition is uh, real. Uh, we wanted to see, because a lot of times a structure may not be in a region where you can uh, get with a still camera, would we be able to take video with a drone and then go ahead and do this modal analysis of the dynamics of the structure? And so we used the DJI Phantom 3 here on the left, sampling at 25 frames per second. And on the right is the actual video. You can see, if you look at the edges, that this is the video flying. It's not a, a still camera. Uh, this is a video from the UAV. And what we found was that um, we were indeed still able to capture the natural frequencies and mode shapes. But because it only was uh, had a frame rate of 25 frames per second, 
then these last two modes were above the Nyquist frequency. So we were able to capture the first four modes uh, very well with that, with that drone. And we've extended that. If you've been to Muhammad, this is known as the Little Golden Gate Suspension Footbridge uh, in the Lake of the Woods Park. And what we wanted to do was to see if we could get the dynamics of this bridge out in a, a real setting. Um, 67 meters in length, the tower is 9.7 meters high. And this is the drone. Uh, it was flown by a student from Dr. Gopavar Fard's group. Uh, the, this is a, a, a mobile phone camera taking a picture. And this is the actual drone footage. We're showing it at two times speed so you can see what's going on. And what you'll see is that there is motion of the bridge that was due to the students uh, walking out of camera range. And here on the left um, are the mode shapes from the UAV. And on the right is a comparison with the finite element model. And you can see that they match, or excuse me, with the accelerometer based results. And you can see that they match up quite well, both in terms of uh, frequency and in the mode shapes itself. Let me talk about the application to railroad bridge monitoring. This is work that we did with uh, Canadian National and they were interested, actually Fernando Moreau, um, a student from University of Illinois, he's now an assistant professor at uh, University of New Mexico. He did a survey of railroads and, it, uh, and indicated that their one of their primary interests was what is the displacement of my bridge when trains go over it and using that as a measure of the health of the bridge. So that's a difficult task though. If you can imagine, you could put a displacement transducer, but they require a reference frame. You'd have to build a scaffolding, it can cost thousands of dollars and may not be so permanent. You could use laser transducers, but those are expensive and they're subject to, the, uh, to, to weather issues. You could use GPS, but the precision of GPS is uh, often not adequate. If you have high precision GPS, it can be uh, exceptionally expensive. You can use accelerometers, and we've done some work in, in that context, but what I'm going to show you about today is using computer vision. Uh, this was in uh, the Rockford subdivision uh, up in Northern Illinois, and you can see that train going across Unfortunately, we had to use lights because the train didn't come by till after dark to prove these ideas. Um, here is the train motion, uh, the actual video that we took and the targets that we identified are in the yellow box. And what I want you to note is by and large, they're not moving. You're seeing virtually nothing. But if you use computer vision, you can see what those displacements are, and they matched up exceptionally well with the finite element model. Uh, you might notice here on the right that there's a phase mismatch between the finite element model and the measurement. And that's because the train started slowing down when it came uh, off the bridge because there was a curve uh, in the track ahead. And so we didn't correct that because we thought that was an interesting feature of this data. The finite element model assumed the track that the train speed was constant. Uh, this is a timber trestle bridge that we tested, and there were very few feature points on that bridge, so we had to add some artificial targets. And what you see is that the uh, the vision-based approach, and in this case, we were comparing to the uh, accelerometer-based approach using wireless sensors they matched up uh, exceptionally well for the dynamic displacement. We also did some uh, flights in the laboratory. This is a drone uh, and we were reproducing the displacements on this hydraulic simulator that we had measured from one of those timber trestle bridges. And when you look at the bottom, this is the drone footage. And if back there is the, um, is, is the actual uh, simulator, hydraulic simulator, which is executing the motions that we measured from the bridge. And it, it seems like it's virtually impossible to get the displacements uh, at this distance. And what we found is that we were indeed able to get the 
motion of the bridge. As you can see on the right, that's a comparison uh, of the actual estimated motion uh, as compared to the reference. And so we get a, a very good tracking accuracy. Here is a, a comparison uh, close up after the experiment was over uh, of the proposed method with the, uh, the reference. Now, I, in, in case you didn't know it, one of the world experts in computer vision is here in our department. It's uh, Dr. Manny Gopalvarfard. And he's been leading efforts in smart construction management. Now, this work is, uh, he gave me a few years ago, but it really illustrates the, the goals of his work. He wants to use uh, as-built documentation to do pro progress monitoring, uh, quality control, safety monitoring, and contractor handoff. So how is the, this done? Well, this is the video, the real video of an a UAV uh, surveying the uh, Sacramento King Stadium during construction. And so what they're able to do is to create from that video a uh, point cloud and then register it with jointly with the um, BIM, the Building Information Management System. And so what they're able to do then is to get a synthetic rendering of what's going on in the construction site as it evolves. And this is the key thing. They're able to assess who does what work at what location and at what time. And you can imagine this would be a tremendous asset to keeping a project on time and holding contractors accountable. So this is some ongoing research that I'll show you in the uh, last few minutes here. Uh, we're doing work with the Army Corps of Engineers and we're interested in these lock gates as shown here. These are miter lock gates uh, and closure of one of these lock gates for a single day results in about $3 million in economic loss. Uh, the typical way to do maintenance is to drain the lock and then do visual inspection again. So we've been working with the core to develop a means to do this. And the idea is to uh, create a, um, to, to do the survey, collect structural images, and then to automate the identification of these cracks and, and other uh, damage features. So this could be done on a regular basis. Um, now the challenge is, is that you can't just go to the, to the lock and dam and take uh, video images. So what we did, uh, is we built a synthetic environment that started out with a finite element model, was combined with uh, the physics, the structural analysis, and then to put that into a synthetic environment, a graphics-based um, environment that represented the real structure, and then do algorithmic damage generation so that we can test out our algorithms before we go to the lock and dam to test them out. And this is an example. On the right is the uh, physical lock, uh, the miter gates, and on the left is the computer imagery. And here you can see we're able to simulate the survey. On, on the right is completely uh, synthetic. It's in the computer. We're able to simulate that, look at different ways for uh, angling the camera, different ways to um, uh, take the uh, different types of lighting conditions, et cetera, and assess what the, um, uh, the best approach is. And so we can look at things like corrosion, cracks, vegetation growth. And this is uh, an example. This again is a synthetic image. And here we've used that to assess some of our algorithms uh, to get corrosion maps, crack maps, and vegetative vegetative growth uh, that's on the, um, on the dam. Okay. Now, a, a project that we're currently working on is this Dow's Lock and Dam. Uh, this is an enormous structure on the Columbia River. We've been out there once for a survey. The students are going out there again on Monday, 650 foot long lock, 86 feet wide and 110 feet tall. 
And so the problem is, is that down at the bottom near the wall, they found cracks. And the question is, what's the source of these cracks? And so we're able to use change detection. This just shows how you can identify the motion of the gates and then do re inverse analysis to try and understand uh, what's causing those cracks based on the uh, motion that we saw during the fill events for this dam. Uh, we also captured video to be able to uh, see what the um, to see what the vibration was of the diagonals, and from that we estimate the frequency and therefore the tension in those diagonals. In my last uh, snippet that I want to tell you about, this is rapid post earthquake monitoring. And this is uh, some work that we did after the 2017 Central Mexico earthquake. Vera uh, Tascari and one of the students from uh, one of our undergraduates went down to Mexico City and worked with uh, a former student of mine, Manuel Ruiz Sandoval. And they were part of a team of 400 structural engineering volunteers uh, deployed to do the post earthquake inspections. And I want to give you an example of this particular building. Uh, you can see it's, it's uh, severely damaged, but the, uh, it was a good example for us to look at the possibility of automating the post inspection process. So first of all, we did flight planning. These yellow lines are where we would, um, we would fly the drone. And this is the actual video that the drone took. You can see on this side of the building, the damage is quite modest, but as we come around the corner, uh, you can see extensive damage due to this earthquake. In, indeed, this building was eventually torn down. Now, we take that imagery and then we can build a 3D point cloud, a virtual representation of that building as you see on the right. And then we do damage identification. From the imagery that the drone has taken, we can get where concrete uh, cracking occurred, spalling, debris, building openings. But the question is, is what does that image mean? Um, it's clear that this is a severely damaged building, but in general, you need to know where this image came from in order to assess its true meaning. And so what we did was we superimposed this damage map onto the building so that you could see uh, where that damage occurs, you could do a virtual uh, inspection after the drone survey, and then be able to do a uh, direct assessment of that structure. So I think my 35 minutes are up, and I want to just uh, draw a couple brief conclusions. Uh, first, research on computer vision-based inspection and monitoring of civil infrastructure is advancing rapidly. I would say this is one of the big uh, fields for civil engineering in the future. Time efficient, cost effective, and eventually completely automated civil infrastructure inspection and monitoring will be enabled, heralding a coming revolution in the way that infrastructure is maintained and managed. And then finally, implementation of this research will ultimately lead to, ultimately lead to safer and more resilient structures uh, throughout the world. So I might say that, you know, I, I think this machine learning and um, computer vision is really one of the uh, critical technologies. It's their game changers. And we have one of the best uh, departments of computer science in this area in the world. And you folks have a chance to take courses there. And as I said, Professor Manny Golpovarfar, he teaches a course on uh, computer vision and civil engineering, and I recommend that to all of my students. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge that much of this work in here was done by Veda Saskeri, who's at University of Houston, uh, Yasutaka Narazaki, who's at uh, the UIUC CJU Joint Institute in Hainan, China, and Brian Ike, who's a research engineer at uh, the CERL, the Construction Engineering Research Laboratory here in Champaign working for the Army Corps of Engineers. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy, happy to answer any questions that you might have.
Javier, maybe unmute the mic. I can't hear you guys. And so it seems like uh, it seems like everybody went dark. Sorry about that. I, I forgot we were muted. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Now we're all I on the same page. I did have a question to start with the question session. In that second to last example, do you guys already know what was causing the damage? Or not yet. You mean for the lock gate? Yeah. No, we. I, I mean, there was speculation. Um, so on that lock gate, they speculated that they had contractors came in to tension the diagonals. Let me go back to that and show you what the diagonals are. Uh, because of time limit, uh, time restrictions, I wasn't able to um, discuss things in great detail. Mm, so do you see these these bars right here Javier yes so because of the asymmetry of this gate when it hangs it's like an open channel and so you get twisting maybe you've seen on a, a gate on a fence there's frequently uh, diagonals that uh, turnbuckles that are tensioned to uh, keep the gate straight and so it's the same idea here so they speculate that those uh, turnbuckles were over tightened and it causes when this gate closes it first touches at the top and there's a gap at the bottom like this and then as the water in the chamber rises it closes the gap and what we saw which was uh, quite interesting what we saw here is that so this is these are the two those are weld access holes and there are two weld access holes and what you can see is that on the left the weld access holes are not moving very much on the right the weld access holes are moving quite a bit so what it looks like is that gap that's down here as the the gates close now it's only three quarters of an inch but on a stiff structure like that it could be a lot it looks like the left gate in this picture is staying in place and the right gate is closing the gap as shown by these weld holes down here. And that's also indicated by this, uh, we, we, you can see that uh, sign there. The green is before the, the water was raised in the chamber and then the purple is after. And so um, it, it looks like it's moving in that frame as, as shown there. So um, we knew, they, they identified the damage but they don't know why the damage is. And they're going to, that they're letting out a contract right now to, or very soon to affect repairs on this gate. And they need to know what was the real cause of the damage of the cracking down at the Pinto at the, uh, the base where it's attached. Uh, there's a spherical ball down there. What was the real cause of this before they try to fix it? They don't want to fix something that isn't the problem. Thank you. That's very interesting. Do we have any questions on the chat? There is one. There's one in the chat. Um, I, I saw that it. So let me read it for those that don't see it. It says, in your opinion, is it possible to use the 3D point cloud simil similar to the damaged building facade from Mexico to estimate the magnitude of motion that buildings experience? And can that be used for analyzing damage of other buildings? And so uh, this is indeed something that we're considering. So the, uh, the idea is that you can look at the damage, you can measure the damage, and then you can do an inverse analysis where that damage is uh, effectively imposed on the finite element model or on an analytical model of the structure. And then you can estimate what the ground motions were. And if you know what those ground motions are, then you could uh, infer what the, the potential damage is at other buildings. Another variation of that is that if you have a um, uh, accelerometer in the basement, which many buildings throughout California do, uh, California, Japan, you have the ground motion and you can feed that into a model of your structure and compare that, uh, the results with your observed damage from your UAV survey and try to get a rapid assessment of what the state of the building is so that people could either return to their, uh, their homes 
or they would know that it's unsafe and they'd have to find some other, uh, some other locations to spend a few days. So um, in, indeed, there's a lot of opportunities there. That was from Saeed uh, Hussein. Well, if we don't have any other questions, I can go ahead and ask another one. Uh, sure. You can go ahead, Jose. Hello, Professor. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I have a. What is your name? You're really small in the video. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jose Rivera. I'm a grad student with Professor Arcadi. My okay. question is the following Can we use LiDAR to complement? Uh, the cameras, or is this technology to, will replace completely the use of LiDAR data or LiDAR surveying for monitoring structures? So LiDAR is not really a good technology to do this kind of task. So, uh, you know, all of these capabilities have their um, benefits and detractors. So uh, LiDAR, can, it certainly helps in doing ranging. So one of the things that we had to do here because you wanted to know, well, what is this displacement? What does it correspond to? And we had to do things like, well, we knew how tall the letters were on this sign. And so we could use that to help us um, assess what a pixel of motion meant. If you have LIDAR, then you know how far your, uh, your structure is away and you can use that as an additional modality. Another modality that you can use is thermal imaging. Um, for example, if you have thermal imaging, you can delineate between, for example, shadows and cracks. So one of the problems we had here is that a fill event takes roughly 20 minutes to occur. And so we were wanting to see the motion of the structure uh, from whenever it was unloaded to when it was fully loaded. And if the sun came by and it could cast different shadows I don't know if I can enlarge this. I guess I can a little bit. Um, you can imagine that shadow, do you see this uh, shadow up here at the top? Uh, on the top left, there's a, a shadow right there. Yes. yes. So we had to, uh, in doing this analysis, you can see even here that that shadow where my hand is uh, was identified in purple. And this shadow was identified in green. And so, uh, by using thermal imaging uh, or IR imaging, using uh, visible light, using LIDAR, uh, this all can be brought together to give us a better picture of the structure. Of course, if you're 200 meters away, LIDAR may, may not be so effective, but the visible, and, and of course the visible uh, images are less effective too, but we can use zoom lenses and things like that, which we did for this, um, for this particular project. Thank you. You're very welcome. I think you have another question on the chat. Maybe we can have that as a last question before we wrap up. So the question was, how can we encourage uh, departments of transportation to use computer vision for infrastructure assessment if many agencies uh, may not have a specific team that can process the data readily. So if you, if you don't have the technical capability within the DOT, uh, then it may be difficult to get them to adopt this technology. And there's good and bad news there. The good news is that because this technology is so, so powerful, there are a lot of commercial entities that are being formed uh, to commoditize uh, these types of things. I believe Professor Gopavar Fard even has a startup company that's in that spirit. Um, and so they're the ones that are gonna take the research that we've been doing and then put it into a packaging that is uh, palatable for the departments of transportation. So while, um, there's a lot of options out there and maybe it's even intimidating. There are quite a few studies by DOTs, uh, for example, uh, at Michigan where they've used drones to do inspections. The railroads are quite interested in this. Uh, they're looking more and more into the use of drones for inspection. 
Uh, but but the the true potential is not just to do the inspection and then have some inspector review the video. It's to be able to automatic autom automatically assess what those images mean in the context of the uh, uh, of the structure to which it's observing. Right. Thank you, Professor Spencer, for the very interesting and informative, informative talk. Before we finish, Professor Kelly was mentioning that next time you need to be here so we can share the pizza with you. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you see him on the video. I don't. It's too small, but I'll just say that uh, the graduate <laughs> student never dies in your heart. And so free food and especially pizza is always a great attraction. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. I think we have to wrap it up for today because it's two, well, a couple minutes past. But thanks everybody for coming and thank you everybody on Zoom. All right. Bye bye. For all the students that are taking the class for a credit, there's a paper going around that they can please sign up on that sheet. And everybody on Zoom, I think we're going to have to do that manually uh, 